Hey, thanks so much for joining us on our channel today. We want to encourage you to subscribe and like today's video. Also, today's word is brought to you by our truth partners. These are people who want to financially invest to help us get this message of truth to around the nation and around the world. You can become a truth partner today by simply going to creativechurch.com slash give. Again, thank you for partnering with us on this message of truth. And thank you for liking and subscribing to today's video. God bless you. I pray this sermon blesses your life. Yeah, come on. Let's give Jesus some praise. Come on. What is up, everybody? Good morning, Creative Church. What's up, Spring Lake Park campus? Man, we are so glad you are here. Wherever you're watching online, everybody, come on one more time. Let's give it up for all of our church family and for the Lord. You can go ahead and have a seat. Welcome, my name is Tim, and uh, I'm so honored to be back at Creative Church again. And um, I, have, I have realized that uh, Pastor Jonathan only invites me here in the winter. <laughs> only like in February. Like, yeah, we're having the most snowfall in the history of Minnesota this week. Will you come? And I said, I don't care how cold it is. I don't care if it's minus 20. I'm coming. If I get a chance to come to Creative Church, I'm coming to Creative Church. So he did promise me, though, that I'm getting a summer invite because I hear the summers are amazing here. And, uh, I, it, you know, in summer, I want to leave Florida. Um, and, you know, the winter, you know, people trying to get to Florida. But I'm glad to be here, Creative Church, and glad to be back. Um, and uh, it's, uh, man, I had, had a great I just love your church. I love your church and I love your pastors and I know you love them, but let me encourage you to love them even more. Um, what a gift they are to the body of Christ and uh, they are a gift to us. Uh, Pastor Jonathan, Pastor Joanne, great friends, amazing people, such an inspiration. This church is an inspiration. Let me encourage you. Um, in Mark chapter six, there's a story where Jesus goes back to his, his hometown. You may be familiar with it. And in verse two, the Bible says that the people were amazed at the things that Jesus was doing and saying. But in verse 3, the Bible says, just the next verse, the Bible says that they took offense. And then by verse 5, the Bible says that Jesus could not do many miracles because of their unbelief. And so I just want to challenge you because sometimes, and I know we're in this Pillow Talk series, and I'm excited to be able to share with you in this series, and, and I'm, I'm going to uh, try to bring something that hopefully encourage you in just a moment um, with regards to relationships. This is true in relationships, that sometimes when you get in the relationship, man, it's amazing. And you start off amazed, and then at some point you take offense, and the next thing you know, you can't receive the blessing from that person anymore because uh, you've, let, you've, let, you've lost that, that awe and that sense of amazement. And the, tr the same is true when it comes to our churches sometimes and with what God is doing in us through the local church. Never lose your sense of amazement of what God is doing here. This is not normal. This is amazing. And, and if you lose that, I'm just telling you, at some point, you'll find offense. If people can take offense at Jesus, that means you can find offense with anybody or anything. It means if you're looking to take offense here at Creative Church, you'll find a reason. If Jesus was the pastor, you'd still find a reason. And so if you lose, don't lose that amazement, stay amazed, stay in awe, stay grateful, stay, stay just in, in, in wonder of what God is doing because he's doing something great here at Creative Church. If you believe it, give God praise one more time. Well, listen, I, I get to join you for Pillow Talk and um, what a great series. I love it. Uh, we're talking about relationships and uh, dating and marriage, just all, all of our relationships. And today I want to uh, share with you um, a, a, a message from a text that's one of my favorite when it comes to relationships. Because the Bible is actually, uh, actually does not have very many um, complete relationship stories where we get to see a couple um, before they meet and then when they meet and as they date and fall in love, get engaged, get married, all the way through all the ups and downs of marriage till death do us part. We don't get a lot of those stories. In fact, you could count them all on one hand. And so because they're so rare, I, this is one of those and it's one of my favorites. And you may know it. It's in Genesis 29. It's the story of uh, a man named Jacob and the woman he loves named Rachel. And and I want to read it for you today as we jump in. Genesis 29 and 16 says, Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah had weak eyes. 
I don't even know what that means, but it doesn't sound good. <laughs> and it's not meant to sound good. Scholars debate a little bit about exactly what it means, but it is clearly uh, an indictment on her lack of physical beauty. Some people think it means that she was cross-eyed or lazy-eyed, Leah, I don't know, weak eyes, exactly what it meant, I don't know. But physically speaking, Leah was not inherently attractive. Rachel, of course, was the exact opposite, the Bible goes on to say, but Rachel had a fine figure, come on, somebody, <laughs> and was beautiful, come on. She wasn't like one of butter faces, you know, like, it's all good butter face. Hey, I just want to take a moment and let you know that today's sermon is brought to you by our Truth Partners. If you're interested in being a Truth Partner, simply go to creativechurch.com slash give and select Truth Partners today. Again, please subscribe and like today's video. It's blessing you. It's blessing your family. And hey, let's get back to the word. Butter, you know? <laughs> you know, from a distance, like, hey, and then up close, you're like, nay. <laughs> no, 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 Rachel, she looked good at a distance, and the closer you got, the better it got. And so, of course, the Bible says that Jacob was in love with Rachel, needless to say. And he said, I'll work for you for seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. And Laban said, it's better that I give her to you than some other man, so stay here with me. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel. But they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. This is where we give a collective awe. Let's do it. Oh, come on, every location. I love it. Oh, it's so, so sweet. Seven years of indentured servitude voluntary slavery, basically. I will serve you and get paid not a dime, but after seven years, I will earn the right to put a ring on your daughter's finger. And yet all of that work and all of that labor, and it seemed like just a few days, is so sweet. But the sweetness runs out real quick. Check it out, the, the very next verse. Uh, then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife. My time is completed, and I want to make love to her. Top five things not to say to somebody's daddy, you know? Because <laughs> I don't think I would have responded the way Laban responded. Laban was like, you know what? It's fair. A deal is a deal. Brought all the people together out of the place and gave a feast. But when the evening came, the feast, right? All day affair, maybe even a multi-day affair. And when the evening came, he took his daughter Leah, lazy-eyed, Leah, Older sister, unattractive older sister, Leah, unwanted Leah, and brought her to Jacob. And Jacob made love to her. Jerry, Jerry. <laughs> I mean, that's, what's going on here? Jake, you work for seven years for somebody. You set your heart, your affection, your eyes on someone, and they are fine, and their sister is not. Hot and not. And you can't tell the difference? When morning came, verse 25 said, there was Leah. Good morning. My title today is, This is Your Wake-Up Call. This is your wake-up call. And listen, if you're in a relationship, you've been in a relationship for any length of time, there, there do come times in your relationship where uh, maybe you roll over, 
Maybe you have an argument, maybe something happens, and all of a sudden you, you get a wake-up call that this is not what I expected. This isn't what I wanted. This is not the way I thought marriage was going to be. This is your wake-up call. And um, I know you young people don't know what that is. Because right now, y'all just tell Alexa, set an alarm. You tell Siri, set an alarm. But back in the day, when you, if you were traveling, you were at a hotel, and you didn't have your own alarm clock, you called the front desk. You dialed zero, and you asked them for a wake-up call. And depending on how heavily you sleep and how easy it is for you to get up, you may have said, hey, I'm going to need a few wake-up calls. I need you to call me at 5.45. I need you to call me at 6. And then I need you to call me again at 6.15. And when you talk to me at 6.15, I need you to tell me, get your butt out of bed for real. You got to get going. And so today, this is your wake-up call. I want to give you three things that if you see them in your relationship, you might want to get up and do something about it, all right? Before we jump in, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Your word is life and light to us. Thank you, God. Thank you that you speak it to us and give us instruction and wisdom. We pray for that right now. Give us the faith to hear, understand, believe, and do what the word says. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Y'all ready? Let's do it. Let's do it. Hey, in 1906, there was this Italian economist. His name is uh, the most Italian name ever, Vilfredo Pareto. And he, he began to observe something about the economy in Italy. And what he observed was that uh, about 20% of the people in Italy controlled about 80% of the wealth in Italy. And as he dove deeper, he began to see this 80-20 uh, tw kind of correlation in uh, different spheres of economy and life. And, and it became known as the 80-20 rule or the Pareto principle. He began to realize that about 80% uh, of, uh, of a, a company's uh, pro product would be produced by about 20% of its workers. That about 20% of a sales force would end up producing about 80% of the sales of a, comp a company. In the church world, we could say it like this. We could, we could draw it like this. That, that like 20% of the members of a church will do 80% of the ministry of the church. Come on, I know that's the 10-10 the, the, the 10, 10 service. Is the Y'all that 20%, right? <laughs> about 20% of the people will give about 80% of the money. About 20% of the people will cause about 80% of the problems. 80-20 rule. And, and, and we see this played out in different ways. Here's the way, one of the ways it gets played out in regards to our relationships. In relationships, we all got um, what we want. And let's just say this is all of what we want. This is every need, every want, every desire, every expectation. This is all that. Right? And when you, when you go into a relationship, that's what you, what do you want. You want all that. You want somebody who's got all that, right? And Rachel in this story, as we begin to hear about Rachel, Rachel sounds like all that. I mean, she's, she's a 10. She's, she's fine. She's, she, she's, she's gorgeous. She's, she's perfect. There's no flaw in her, and it's just amazing. But, but here's the challenge is that in any relationship, um, um, here, here's your first wake-up call. We're going to call them unmet expectations, because in any relationship, you, you may want all that. We all want all that. But here's what I found. There's only one in the world that's all that, right? And they crucified him 2,000 years ago, right? There's only one perfect. But Paul said in a place, he said, you have to make allowance for each other's faults. What does that mean? It means that people are people. You got to let people be people and God be God because nobody is perfect. Nobody is all of that. In fact, if you're lucky, you get somebody who's about... 80% of that. 80-20 rule. Nobody's all that. If you are married to an amazing man, an amazing woman, they may provide you with 80% of your wants, needs, and desires and be what you want to have in your life. But the problem is so many times we, we want 100. We got 80. We, want, we, married, we married Rachel because we thought she was all that. And then one day we rolled over and found out that every Rachel comes with Aaliyah. 
Come on, you married, you thought you was getting Rachel and you rolled over and there's Leah. Now, now this is where you marry people. If you've been married very long, this is where you know, you act like you don't know what I'm talking about. Come on, married men, you're like, I, yeah, I eat crazy, I don't know, babe. That, that may be his story, but that ain't mine. You all, you all that, you're not. You got some Leah. Listen, everything in life, everything you want in life comes with something you don't. Everything. Everything. The, the, the better job that makes more money, that's awesome. It's great. It's great. It just comes with more stress. Right? Right? Even, even man, marriage and, and I don't have to be lonely anymore and I've got companionship, but it comes with some, it comes with some mess. Kids, kids are amazing. I love my kids, but kids come with chaos. Every good thing, everything you desire, everything that I want that thing comes with something you don't want. Every Rachel comes with a, I get it. J Jacob ends up marrying two women. You, you don't get married. You didn't marry, hopefully, maybe. I mean, who knows? You know, two women um, at the same time. If so, we got a lot of work to do in the next 20 minutes or so. Uh, right? But, but, but you did. You didn't marry two women, but you did marry two women. You married the one you like, and then... <laughs> and let me not, just not admit, pick on the women, right? It's not just Rachel and Leah. It's Randall and Leon. <laughs> Leah was lazy-eyed. Leon just lazy butt. <laughs> and I promise you, every, the best man in the world, he got some Leon in him. <laughs> The, the, the best woman in the world, she's got, there are, there's a part of her that's not perfect. And we've got expectations that it's going to be one way. And then when you roll over at some point, maybe not the next day, maybe you get, you know, you get the honeymoon at least. You know, the word honeymoon literally just means sweet month. That's about it, right? And then at some point you're going to realize, hey, there's some stuff that I didn't, I didn't, bank on. There's some stuff I didn't ask for. There's some stuff I didn't expect. I didn't realize it was going to be like this. And if you're in a relationship with a person, they're never going to be a hundred percent. And so there's going to be a part of them that does not meet your expectations. There's going to be a part of them. And so the question is not, how do I love Rachel? Everybody loves Rachel. Rachel's hot. Rachel's amazing. Randall, he always does the things I want him to do, meets all my needs. The question is, can you love Leah? Can you love the Leon in your Randall? Can you love the, like the whole person, even though the whole person is not 100% everything that I would want them to be because they're a person? I'm in a relationship with a, a person. Come on, I'm not, I'm not dating a, a, a robot. This is an AI. This is a human being. I have to make allowance for their, for their, for their humanity. They're not going to be, they can't be everything. They don't have all that. They're not all that. They're not God. They're just human. And so can I love Leah? Because I have unmet expectations. Where do our expectations come from? I love it because the, the text actually kind of answers that. Chapter 29 actually answers that. Because Jacob wakes up and there's Leah. You would have expected that he would, he would have noticed that the switch had happened. I mean, granted, in the, in the ancient world, uh, they would have been likely not only uh, completely dressed, probably covered entirely, but veiled, very much veiled. But let's be real. Even if all he saw was... Them eyes, like the one thing he could have seen was those lazy, I mean, those weak eyes. He should have known. Like, why didn't he know? Because it was after the party. Come on, that, that was a party. When you so drunk, when you like, when you party so hard that they can switch out the women and you don't even notice. But he woke up the next day. And, uh, and he realized um, there's a mistake that's been made. He runs out to find Laban, the father of Rachel and Leah. And he finds him. He says, what'd you do to me? I worked seven years for Rachel. I wanted a hot one. You gave me the not one. Why? And Laban says, oh, yeah, that's, you didn't know? We don't do it like that here. It is not our custom to give the younger daughter in marriage before the older daughter in marriage. So yes, you can marry Rachel, but before you marry Rachel, you got to marry Leah. That's not the way they do it where you're from. 
Jacob's like, no, that's not the way to do it anywhere. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Why didn't somebody tell? Like for seven years, we've been going through this whole thing and nobody thought maybe we should tell him about our custom. <laughs> you know what? This is where, where, where do you get expectations from your customs? Where do you get your customs from your people? From your families of origin, generally speaking. And here's what I found. Everybody's got customs and everybody's got some customs that are crazy. So, so, so you're not just dating the girl. You are entering into a whole new set of customs. If you are dating, if you're engaged, you better find out about them crazy customs. They got them. If you haven't found them yet, you're just going in blind. It's not that, oh, oh they're normal. No, no, no. They got some crazy. Like, like Leah doesn't think it's weird. Laban doesn't think it's weird. Rachel doesn't think it's weird. They're not like, hey, this is just kind of may, may, may trip you up. This is how we do it. I know it's crazy. No, they all think it's normal. They're like, yeah, 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 yeah. This, yeah, yeah, you married my older sister. That's normal. Customs. And if you're not careful, you, you bring these expectations in. Like for me, um, you know, my, my father-in-law, um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's still February. But right now in Florida, it's like, it, it is, it's, it's 80. It, right now already, it's, it's 11.53. We're, they're, they're an hour ahead of us right now. It's like 11.53 right now, which is almost lunchtime. It's already 82 degrees, 85 degrees. My father-in-law right now, this very moment, guarantee you right now, he doesn't have any clothes. I'm not, in, in, not any clothes. He's got some shorts on. That's it. Barefoot, no shirt. He's outside working with the landscaping. He's got scissors. He's, he's, he's on his knees cutting the grass. He's talking to some plant, fertilizing somebody. I mean, he is, he is the, he's, his name is Larry. Larry the landscaper. And when my wife married me, she just assumed I was going to do them bushes like Larry does them bushes. She found out, though, I don't do bushes. I don't do, like, like I, can, I can cut grass, but I don't like it. I know how to, you know, trim hedges, but I don't like it. I don't love, like, it's, it's not, like, I'll pay somebody to do that. But she, she like, she, she was, she got married. She, I didn't know it. She, she got married. We got married. And she was thinking yard of the month every month. We ain't never got yard of the month. We ain't never going to get yard of the month. <laughs> I'm not Larry the landscaper, but guess what? She's also not, my mama's name is Renee. She's also not Renee the roast maker. Because I'll be honest with you, one thing, Sundays, I'm from the South. Sundays, we go to church, we come home, there was a big di dinner, roast, mashed potatoes and gravy, come on. It was all there, it was amazing. And I thought, man, Sundays are going to be great, I'm going to, you know, we're going to do ministry, I'm going to preach, we're going to come home, and when I get home from preaching, there's going to be some roast and mashed potatoes. <laughs> nope. My wife doesn't like roast. She won't cook roast. In fact, she cooked the roast for the first time in like two years, about two weeks ago, and it wasn't good. <laughs> now, here's the question you got to ask. At best, I'm going to get 80%. Now, some of y'all married somebody will be like, I don't think I got 80. I think I got about, I think I only got 20. <laughs> what you got to ask is, if you're dating, here's what you got to ask. Is the 20% they don't have are my non-negotiables in that 20% or in the 80% they do have? I just got, like, you just got to know, like, can I deal with you not making roast? And the answer is yes, because my wife does a lot, a lot of other things. She blesses my life in so many different ways. And the truth is, I can, like, I can get roast from somebody else. Come on, there's some stuff I can't get from nobody else. I can pay somebody to make a roast. I can buy a roast. There's some people I cannot pay to do some things that my wife Just saying, I'm just saying, like, there's some, there are some things that, like, that are non-negotiables that I need for my spouse to be, that, that like, we got to be on the same path. I need a woman of faith. I need, there are things I need. And, and so the question is, can I deal, can you deal with me not being Larry the landscaper? And my wife, she, she would prefer it. Sometimes she'll even say, I really wish you would, I wish you would take more pride in the yard. I wish you would, you know, yard of the month. Just call me Leon right now, baby, because I'm just telling you. 
I'm not saying I'm not going to try. I'm not going to say I'm not going to try to get better, but I'm going to tell you, I'm probably never going to meet your expectation in this area. As my, even if I did my very best, I'm never going to be your dad. I'm never going to meet the expectation of your customs. So unrealistic expectations. Here, here's the next one. Unrealistic expectations a lot of times lead to unfair comparisons. So when, I, when, I, when I've got 80, but I'm missing 20, at some point, listen to me what happens. At some point, what we start doing is we start fixating on what they're not. We start focusing on what they lack instead of what they have, on what they don't do for us instead of what they do, on, 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 the, on the things that get on our nerves instead of the things that bless our lives. And here's the 80 20. You want 80 20? It, and, and I do believe this oftentimes becomes the case, is we spend 80% of our effort, our energy, our words on their 20% that annoy us. Instead of, instead of celebrating the 80% they do, instead of giving most of our attention to the blessing that they are in our life, speaking life over that, we end up focusing and fixating on the negative and speaking to that, criticizing that, complaining about that, na nagging about that, comparing that. Here's what happens is, is I, start, I start looking at the 80 you know, and the 20 and the 20 I don't have. And, and if I'm not careful, I look at the 20, I start longing for the 20. Man, it would be nice if I had somebody who would make me some roast on Sunday, right? Oh, man, it'd be nice if I wish my husband, and we start comparing, and I find somebody else. There's somebody out there who makes roast for her husband on Sunday. Must be nice. Oh, I wish my husband, I wish my husband talked to me like he talks to his wife. I wish my wife, I wish she, she did this for me like, like this woman does for her husband. And we start fixating on the 20 that we don't have and we start comparing. And the problem is they're unfair comparisons because you're never comparing reality to reality. You're comparing reality to perception. And what you're really comparing is reality to projection. You're comparing, listen to me, this is what you're comparing. You're comparing a, a, a driver's license photo with somebody's Instagram post. You know, the, the, the difference is the people with the driver's license, they don't care about your feelings. They don't care, they don't care, they don't care. They don't, they, if you want to know what reality looks like, it's your driver's license picture. That's how you really look. I'm sorry. No, 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 it's this Instagram post. No, it's not. That's not you. That's been filtered out so many times. Your children don't even remember. Mommy, who's that? <laughs> That's me. What are you doing? No, Mommy, where are all your wrinkles? Shut up. <laughs> and, you're, and you're comparing your struggle, the 20% that he doesn't do, the 20% you don't get from your marriage. You're comparing what you lack with their strength, with, 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 with your reality. That, that, and so you start comparing, comparing and looking at the 20, and then you start longing for the 20. And at some point, if you're not careful, at some point, somebody's going to walk into your life who offers the 20. Somebody's going to come and be like, oh, I'll, I'll make a roast for you, Pastor. <laughs> The devil is a lie. <laughs> right? Oh, I'll, I'll take care of them straws for you, girl. Right? Uh, there's somebody, somebody walks into my life and they got the 20 that my spouse doesn't have. That my, not just my spouse, my marriage is lacking. My relationship is lacking. And if I'm not careful, I'll trade my 80 for the 20. Here's the lie, though, of comparison. Because even that 20... Got a 20? <laughs> so she, so oh, I get that, that, that. If I was with them, then I'd be happy because they got the thing I'm like. That if my marriage was like that, and so then we trade what we got for something else only to find that what we traded for, it's got something missing too because everything you want comes with something you don't. Everything you want comes with something you don't. And you think it's going to be perfect. You think it's going to be amazing, but it's not. And now all of a sudden, this is the new 80. But ah, there's this other 20. And I start fixating on their 20, focusing on their 20, longing for their 20. And before you know it, I trade that 20 for what I have. But listen, even that 20 got a 20. <laughs> 
And now, and now I start focusing on this. Oh, man, but I don't have this thing. And before you know it, listen, if you focus on what you don't have, you'll forfeit what you do. And I have given up so much grace and goodness and blessing. And then I wonder why I'm left with less and less and less. Comparison never leads you with more. It never brings more grace, more goodness, more blessing into your life. It just, you just go chasing after less and less and less the thing you don't have until you've got nothing left at all. Don't play the comparison game. The comparison game will kill your relationship. So what are, the, what, are the, what are the solutions to these? Well, first of all, when it comes to unmet expectations, the solution is I am going to accept the limited nature of people and the finite nature of God. I'm going to let God be God and people be people. I am not going to put God-sized expectations onto my spouse or somebody in my life. I, I, I'm not going to expect them to do for me and be for me what only God can be for me. I'm not going to expect them to be all that. They can't be all that. They can, they're going to be some of that. They may be even most of that. I'm going to celebrate what they are. That's the second thing. I'm not going to compare what they're not. I'm going to celebrate what they are. Let me tell you three things really quickly. Let me give you these real quickly. I'm going I'm to give you our final point today, and we'll get out of here. Three things not to compare specifically. I'm telling you, comparison will destroy a relationship. The first thing is to, to, to compare your relationship with somebody else's relationship. Again, it's apples to apples. You, you're compare, comparing your struggle with their strength. You, you're comparing what, what your behind the scenes with their highlight reels. Well, they always, you don't know what they always do. You know what they let you think they always do. You know what they post about what they always do. You don't know the reality. Trust me, every, everything you want comes with something you don't. Every relationship got it. There's another 20%. Every Rachel got a Leah. Every Randall got a Leon. They got it too. Don't compare with another couple. Here's, uh, here's another thing that's important. Don't compare to one another. That's the second comparison you've got to avoid. Me versus you. I do more, and I try harder, and I bring more, and I'm all in, and you don't do. We start keeping tabs and keeping score, even though the Bible says love keeps no record of wrongs. But I, I begin to compare. The only way I can compare is if I'm keeping the score, and now all of a sudden, I, it's your fault, and you do this, and I do this. And In fact, Rachel and, and, and Jacob get into an argument at one point because they can't have any children. Rachel was hot. Listen, everybody's got struggles. Rachel was beautiful. Jacob loved Rachel, but Rachel couldn't have children. 20%. Leah, Leah wasn't very attractive, but Jacob and Leah built a beautiful family together. But the romance wasn't there, 20%. Every marriage, every relationship, everything in your life is going to come with something, the thing you want with something you don't. So Rachel can't have any children. She comes to Jacob. She says, give me children. I need to have children. In fact, she's almost suicidal. She says, or I'll die. And and they're arguing. And Jacob basically makes it plain because Jacob has already fathered four children with Leah. And so he tells Rachel, my stuff works. I mean, basically, <laughs> the, pro the problem is not here. Right? Because clearly, I fathered four kids. You're the problem. And it, it, you start comparing, I'll compare my relationship with their relationship, but I also compare within my relationship, me to you. What I bring to the table, what you bring to the table. How hard I'm working, how hard you're working. Here's the third thing not to compare. Don't compare, don't compare your relationship now to your relationship then. Well, it's just not the same as it used to be. It doesn't feel the same. We read the story and we read where it said that Jacob worked for seven years right? And it felt like a few days. That was the first seven-year stint he, he, he did. He ended up having to work for 14 years for Rachel. He worked seven years. He thought he was getting Rachel. He got Leah. He says, hey, what happened? Oh, yeah, that's not the way it works. You, you actually have to take Leah first. Well, I want Rachel too. Okay, well, you can work for another seven years, but here's the, here's the good news. I'm not going to make you wait. I'm not going to make you work the next seven and then get Rachel. 
So I'm going to give her to you, but it would be inappropriate for me to give her to you like the next day after you married her sister. That would be weird. <laughs> so we're going we're gonna to give them a week, and then you can marry her younger sister who you really want more than her. That would be okay. So that's what we're going to do. So that's what he did. So he worked, he worked from seven years, married Leah, was with Leah a, a, a week, married Rachel, and then had to work another seven years for Rachel. Here's, here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that for the first seven years, it seemed to him like just a few days. You know what it didn't say about the second year, seven years? It didn't say them second seven years seemed like a few days. Them second seven years seemed like a few decades. The second seven years did not feel the same way that the first seven years felt. Can, can, we, can we be honest? The work after the wedding is always harder than the work before. Anybody can do seven years, but, oh, he's amazing. I'm in love. No, you're not in love. You're on drugs. That's, I mean, it's, that's what, so, so what psychologists tell us is that your brain is producing specific chemicals that you, we call being in love, and, and we, we're on this cocktail of drugs, and it lasts uh, from, from anywhere from six weeks to 18 months at the most. Of course, many of us decide, let's get married while we're on drugs. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, at some point, we roll over. There's Leah. The drugs have worn off. And all of a sudden, we can see. And we're like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's not the same. I don't feel the same way I felt before. Can I tell you, real love is not anybody can do the first seven years. That's not love. That's drugs. <laughs> that, that's, that's, that, that's a cocktail. That's, that's lust. That's a, that's a whole lot of stuff. Real love is the second seven years. Real love is what you do when you don't always feel like it. Real faith isn't showing up to creative church when you, everything's going well and you feel like it. Real faith is showing up when you don't. Real faith is praying when you don't feel like it. Real faith is pressing through when you don't. Real love, the seven, the seven second is where it's, the second seven is where it's at. I don't feel, it don't feel the same. Well, of course it don't feel the same. It's not supposed to feel the same. The whole reason you make vows, you make vows when you feel like it specifically for the times when you're not going to feel like it. There's coming a day we're going to get sick, so in sickness or in health. Coming a day when, when it's going to get worse, so for better or for... Don't compare where you are now to where you used to be, the way it used to be. And, and can I be real? For some of us, the reason it don't feel like it felt, I just don't feel like it felt. It's because you're not doing what you did. If you want to feel what you felt, you got to do what you did. Well, when we were dating, well, think about all the stuff you used to do when you were dating. Think about how, how hard you, you worked. Think about how you pursued him, how you pursued her, how much investment you made, how much you, you talked. You talked just hours. Me and my wife, we, we dated this before, texted, like back in the Stone Ages. <laughs> the iPhone hadn't been, they had not invented an iPhone yet. Seriously. We used to just talk until she fell asleep. I just listen to her breathe. <laughs> right now, she starts breathing heavy a little bit. I start kicking her. Be like, hey. <laughs> I, used to just, I just love to hear you breathe. Now I'm like, hey, 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 hey. <laughs> so some of us are, are expecting emotion to create motion when the truth is motion generally creates emotion. If you want to change how you feel, change, how you're, ch change what you're doing. Here's the last one. In fact, if the team wants to come out and help us land this plane. Um, the last one we're, we're going to call unholy priorities. Unholy priorities. And let me just read this verse for you. I'll give this and we'll get out of the way. Unfair comparisons, unholy priorities. Genesis 30, the next chapter. Rachel saw she's not having any children. She's upset. She's jealous. She says to Jacob, give me children or I'll die. Jacob got angry with her. And, and, and check out this question. This is, 
I think, such a critical question. He says, am I in the place of God? Unholy priorities. If you're writing down notes, you could write down beside that in parentheses, idolatry. I'm talking about a wake-up call. A wake-up call is when I have built my relationship on the wrong foundation. He said, have you put me in God's place? Here's what idolatry is. Idolatry is putting a good thing in God's place. Nobody, nobody, listen, nobody commits to idolatry with something that's bad, right? I mean, in the ancient world, they, like the Israelites fell down and worshiped a golden calf, like something valuable, gold. It's good. It's just not God. Marriage, it's good, but it's not God. Kids, good, not God. A great career, good, but not God. And here's what happens. I don't know if I got all my pieces. Yeah, I got them. If you're not careful, as you start trying to build your life, friends or career, good stuff, not God. Here's what some, some married people do. We're, we're building our marriage on children, our kids. It's kid-centered, it's kids first. You know they're going to leave, right? And you're going to roll over and look at somebody and not even recognize them. There's Leah. Because I spent all of our attention fo- focusing on these kids. Some of us, we, 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 we put our spouse, man, if I put them first, it'll work. I'm just going to put them first. Just gonna. And, and, and what happens when you put good things into God's place is you start playing Jenga with your life and your future and your family. You're trying to hold it all together, balance it all out, and it never works. And then you come to pillow talk and you find out that God is the only one that's all that. But listen, if you're not careful, you just try to throw some some Jesus on the top. Hold on, hold on, preacher. And now I feel guilt and condemnation because I didn't do it the right way. My life is all, listen, whenever, God, God is not the cherry on top of your life. He is the foundation on which we build. And the Bible, I know you know this, the Bible teaches that when God is first, everything else is blessed. Come on, in your finances, in your time, in, your, in, in everything in your life, if I put God first, then, then my relationship with my spouse can be blessed. Then my relationship with my kids can be blessed. Then my career can be blessed. My life can be blessed. If God builds the house, the Bible says if, if God doesn't build the house, if he's not the foundation, we are laboring in vain. Have you put somebody or something in God's place? and you're trying to make this work, wondering why it keeps crashing down, or you keep going from relationship to relationship because you think this person can be all that for me. This person can meet my needs and fulfill my desires. And I'm telling you, there is not a single person on the planet who can do that. There's only one who can, and that's God. And if you'll let him be first then you know what you can do? Then you can let the people in your life be people. I don't need you to be all that because he's already all that. He's the one who meets all my needs according to his riches in glory. So I don't need you to meet all my needs. Give me your best 80. Come on, do your best. I'm gonna bring my best, but I'm gonna trust God to be my everything. So as we close today, we go to prayer. I wanna challenge you. If, if you have any other foundation, I'm just telling you, it's, it's not going to work. It's not going to last. And if you have, if you've built your life on something else, today would be a good day, not just to throw God on top, but to say, God, I want you to be the foundation of my life. I want to build my relationships, my family, my future on you. So at every location, come on, let's bow our heads. Just take a moment. I want to pray with you. If you're here today, maybe you never have made God the first thing, the foundational thing in your life, or maybe you did, but you've 
You've gotten away from God. Tried to build your life on different things only to watch it crumble and crumble and crumble. I'm telling you, it'll happen over and over again until you fix the foundation. Let God be first. Come on, if you need to do that today, would you pray with me as I pray out loud? Pray it in your heart right now, wherever you are. God, right now, we make you the first thing in our lives. You are all that. You are everything we need. You you are the one who meets every need and fulfills every deepest desire, God. We know that nobody else can be for us what only you can be for us. So today we say, yes, God, be our God, be our Savior, our Lord, our King, our God, our foundation. Forgive us of our sins, wash us, cleanse us. And from this day forward, I will build my life. I will build my marriage. I will build my future. I'll build my business. I'll build my family. I'll build it all on who you are and what you say. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, if this sermon blessed you and your family, I wanna encourage you to be a truth partner. You can do that by simply going to creativechurch.com slash give and partnering with us to help get this message of truth out to more people in our nation and around the world. It is our truth partners that make this a reality. Again, thank you for subscribing to our channel. Thank you for liking today's video. We'll see you back here on the channel real soon.